So kia ora, um, I'm Rachel Hendry and I'm chairing today's session about, um, which has a series of papers about libraries and archives. And um, I'm speaking from the dark lands of the dark people in Western Sydney. And I'd like to acknowledge that this land belongs to them and was never ceded and acknowledge their ancestors and their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so we've got two short papers and a long paper today, and we'll go through all of those without questions after each, and then we'll have a question discussion session at the end. We should have plenty of time to have a bit of a discussion that ties them together. I think there's probably quite a few threads that cross the papers. If you do have to leave after one of the earlier papers and aren't around for the discussion, but have a question or a comment that you would like other people to think about and hear about, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll read that out um, in the question session anyway. Otherwise, um, please use the hands up symbol, which you hopefully have now been able to find after a few sessions um, to indicate that you have a question and I'll call on people individually in that question time. So without any further ado, the first paper is a short paper by Alexis Tyndall, Ingrid Mason and Sydney Shep. And it's called Come to the Party, Bring a Plate, Artificial Intelligence, Libraries, Archives, Museums, and the DH Community, Demystifying the Work. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, I'd like to say hello from the wonderful lands of the Ghana people, known now as Adelaide. Um, and uh, it's a beautiful day here, a little bit damp, but nice and springy. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and just check we can see that. Is that working for you? Some nods? Yeah, cool. Um, all right, so I'm here for a short paper today, so I'll try and keep it brief. Um, Sydney will be joining us later here um, to talk about our Australian New Zealand network of the artificial intelligence for libraries, archives, museums uh, community. Um, so this is basically something, some of you might be familiar with it. During the middle of last year or so, um, uh, Ingrid Mason, a good friend and colleague to many in the sector, um, was sort of thinking about how to uh, find a base for the AI for land community in Australia and New Zealand. This is a community that has popped up internationally. It arose from a couple of conferences that happened at Stanford and at the Bibliothèque Nationale France, um, and basically started to say, look, we, we might need some community thinking about how we're using artificial intelligence and machine learning in this community, both um, in terms of our regular challenges within the library, archives and museums sector, and also how we support our users who are wanting to use those technologies um, in relation to our, our, um, our collections. Um, this is a, a community of practice um, and I'll just, oh, yeah. Um, and so it's organised in Australia and New Zealand by a volunteer network of community coordinators. This is a community of practice and critical reflection space for Australia and New Zealand, encouraging discussion and knowledge transfer around how AI in all its various guises might shape users' information practices and expectations in cultural heritage institutions and clients. Now, this network of people is a lovely network of people and not a single one of them is an absolute expert in artificial intelligence. I'll pop that out there right now. Um, basically, what it is, is we've got a people who here are working in libraries, archives, people who are working as researchers, people who have um, uh, work who work in uh, IT and computer um, position, uh, computer science positions as well, and all basically chipping our bit in to see if we can advance dis discussion and conversation about these areas in Australia and New Zealand. The um, what have we done? Over this period of time, we've put on a series of webinars and some of you may have attended them. Um, we have supported a practice-based network in one case, which was talking about education and AI and spotlighted projects in our region that are, um, that are experimenting and learning in this space. The highlights that might be of interest to the digital humanities community were quite a few showcases of LAM organisations who are conducting controlled experiments in application of AI to common real world challenges working with web services, working with automated image tagging, aiming to improve item level discoverability of large image collections, um, extracting and improving discoverability of entities like people's places and things in digitized records. Um, we had a really interesting project about turning large scale digitization projects into structured and machine readable data or research ready data. Um, which was a real proof of concept coming out of the ANU archives to, and articulated the work that's involved in that challenge. 
And one of the more interesting ones I found in Sydney here was the presenter on that one was about exploring the potential for AI approaches to change the nature of our work. And she talked about the Colenso, the work they've been doing with the William Colenso collection. Um, and I actually thought it had something to say in that sort of decolonising challenge that our sector is facing at the moment, where what it went what it meant was you had this large group of collections that centred the colonist and bringing AI and new ways of accessing and combining those collections together actually decentered and moved to that point of perspective out of our traditional collection management and knowledge structures. So that was an interesting one, especially as we're thinking about our ethical obligations as custodians of people's collections. This is a network based on sharing. No single project that we've showcased has solved the challenge for that application. Many of them have posed questions rather than showcasing successes. Each contributor in this space is bringing a plate. Inching our fuel community forward and in a question or trial at a time is breaking down the monolith of AI and what it means for us, our collaborators and our collections. And with that, I'll hand over to Sydney. Tato. Yes, thanks, Alexis, and thanks, Ingrid. Um, always the mover and shaker behind the scenes. I guess what we've learned is, is numerous. Um, things. And part of that bringing the plate um, is reflected in the fact 30 years ago, coming from Canada, bringing the plate meant what, what's happening here, you know, come for tea. No, it's dinner. Bring a plate. A plate? Why? You don't have a plate. Anyway, so this kind of cultural collision has been informing a lot of the work that occurs in this intersectional space, AI, LAM, and DH. And I think it's really worth exploring what the challenges are of working in that space, but what the opportunities are as well. So when, when we talk about data curation, um, I'm always reminded of Tim Sherritt's comment that's gone down in the annals of DH, just give us the effing data when he's talking to institutions, because uh, as we heard from Rachel, um, government agencies, institutions in the glamour sector, um, those spaces tend to be risk averse. And in order for them to step out of those spaces, in order to release data, to not over curate it, to think that they can't get it perfectly right before it's handed over to these people called or these amazing things called researchers, how do we actually um, bridge that? gap? How do we let the data go, let it go freely or let it go more particularly with a set of uh, professional responsibilities to both the collections that we curate, that we are kaitiaki for, and the people that those represent. Um, and in that space, thinking about, as uh, Ingrid will often say, the five safes, are really a critical way of framing up these conversations that in a way articulate with the care and the fair principles, which if you heard Simon Musgrave's um, panel speak yesterday, Simon was talking about an interesting distinction between the fair principles of findability, accessibility, et cetera, are ones that are targeted towards the user and the care principles like collective benefit and the others are ones that the service providers, the data providers should be thinking about. But I think in many ways, if you combine those both and think about the five safes, safe people, safe projects, data settings and outputs, and overlay that, at least in our context here, with um, uh, Aotearoa New Zealand's tikanga around um, working in this data curation space, then it's a highly complex area that requires much collaboration and much conversation. So thinking about what our responsibilities are to our people, as well as our response, uh, responsiveness to tikanga are incredible. Now I'm advocating for cooperation and collaboration, but in my experience, when you start thinking about big data, immediately you're working with computer programmers, people who are in the engineering space, people who are in the STEM space who have no idea about the richness of data, what you can do with it, uh, no idea that small data actually has as many challenges as big data. And I'll just exit with a, a conversation um, at which I won't name the entity in question, uh, but conversations around cultural AI. When you think about the largest source of data in the world is coming out of cultural collections. With the digitization mania that's gone for many years, we have huge amounts of resource that we need to unlock. And how do we do it? Well, we use OCR techniques, we use data mining, we use foundational computer science um, techniques and tools. 
And yet, when you talk to people about cultural AI, and these are ones who are shifting their discourse from machine learning to AI, these are people who say, we're doing the foundational research. We're doing the hardcore engineering. You guys are just talking about it. You guys are talking about the social implications, the policy issues, the ethics, etc. So immediately we're not on the same page. To try and say that cultural AI is an integral part of computer science engineering is actually in their terms, heresy, blasphemy, etc. And I'm not overstating the case because it's just a total uh, sense of two parallel universes that aren't going to meet anytime soon. So when we're starting to think about the intersectionality of AI, LAM, and DH, let's think also about those people that we're bringing into the space, but how are we are being excluded from certain spaces where we need to be around the table? It's all very well to talk about STEM to STEAM, and wonderful Alexander added another M at the end, and I hope he talks about it through the conference, adding Mataronga into the space. But what does it mean to actually sit around the table with our STEM colleagues, to be around the table for policy decisions and funding decisions? And with that, I'll turn back to Alexis. Thanks very much, Sydney. Some really good food for thought there. It's a short paper, so I'm just actually going to wind us up. Um, just saying, basically, what do we, what, how do we, what we're interested in talking about is how um, the LAM sector and how DH professionals work together. Can we think about new ways, new and collaborative approaches to research, research development and ideation? I think that's a space where we've got a lot of potential to work. And how do we think about the information professional, data scientist and humanities scholar collaboration? And that's a couple of themes that we actually saw in Rachel's keynote talk as well. Um, so just at the bottom, if you want to get involved, there's an AI for LAM website. You can join the mailing list on there. They have a Slack, uh, Slack workspace with an AUNZ channel. Um, and there we are fast approaching the Future Fantastique, excuse my uh, accent, conference on the 9th and 10th of December. This will be a hybrid conference. Notably, there is one workshop on the program that's in the AUNZ time zone, suitable. And all of our past webinars are recorded and available on the University of Adelaide YouTube page. And I'll share all those links in the chat. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Alexis and Sydney and Ingrid. That was a fantastic paper. So the next one that we have is Lisa Chisholm, Judy Fisher and Alexander Ritchie talking about open hours, librarians yakking and hacking community in Te Pukapu, Otago. Well, thank you. We'll just uh, clear our screen. I'll get started. Tēnā <laughs> koutou Hi, everybody. Um, and we have Lisa Chisholm and also Alexander Ritchie here on Zoom. And we're all subject librarians from the University of Chicago in Otipoti, Dunedin, South Island, New Zealand. Uh, Lisa and I are going to talk about the evolution of a collaborative digital humanities program involving the Division of Humanities and the Library. And we have Alexander as a key part of the project. He was responsible for naming our presentation and he's given our mihi on chat and will be available to answer questions at the end. The project began a few years ago with the creation of a digital humanities uh, library guide, which was developed and launched by subject librarians in collaboration with academic staff. And it's a pathway to tools, peak projects and people for novices through to the experts in the field. Then subject librarians were invited to participate in the inaugural digital humanities um, 2016 Expo, which where we presented or they presented on the Marsden Digitization Project of Reverend Samuel Marsden's uh, journals and manuscripts in collaboration with the Hocken Library in Dunedin. But Lisa and I came in um, at this last piece here, the invitation to be involved in the new Digital Humanities De Bukupu, uh, hub, which was a small space located in the Department of English and Linguistics and the Humanities Building on the Dunedin campus. Uh, so as I said, can we just change that? I'm having, so having issues with our keyboard. Keyboard, there we go. Oh, okay. I'm back, sorry. So um, Lisa and I were new to the field, so to be prepared to support the hub, 
um, our more experienced DH colleagues in the library created intensive training sessions for us. And Alexander was actually the key to this. He was learning from his interaction with his subject areas. So he mentored us to discover and learn about the different DH tools, techniques, and outputs, both digital, uh, internationally and locally. I think we got quite excited about the potential of digital humanities when we were learning about it and the projects that were actually happening at Otago. And they were inspiring, especially the PhD research that was happening. Um, Alexander also represented the library at the DH Steering Group, which gave him a broader, more strategic overview of digital humanities at Otago. And there was a digital humanities community of practice set up across all library departments to chat about interests and projects in the library space, which were happening at the time. Um, we were lucky to be supported by our library executive, which is important because the program took up a lot of time over and above our usual workloads. Um, so the, the project involved interested academic and professional staff and postgrad students from classics, English, linguistics, media, film and communication, religious studies, archaeology and computer science. It was a 10 month progr program pre-COVID. Um, the idea that was that as we as librarians have connections across a variety of subject areas, we bring together interested people, both academic and professional staff and students to chat and collaborate about all things DH. Firstly, we staffed the little hub on Fridays for two hours, just to have it open to promote it to people to drop in and check out the space. We also put together 18 informal seminars, all hosted by us, but we organised speakers from across the university to talk about their research or teaching. This, once again, included academic students, librarians and IT staff. So, this is the hub, affectionately known as the Hubbard, because it's really very small. Uh, but we could say that size made it, the sessions more intimate. Uh, we fitted eight people comfortably. We squished 10 in, obviously pre-COVID, it was okay. Um, the technology in the space was a high gaming, a high, high spec gaming computer, uh, VR gear, linguistics lab, um, iPads and projects. Um, so that's an example of some of our little sessions we were doing there. This is an exterior view. Um, there was a display of old gaming technology which the students had put together of a, um, of a project for a project as well. We promoted our weekly sessions via social media, the Di Digital Humanities blog, posters around the university, both print and digital, and targeted emails. And now I'll hand over to Lisa from, for some reflections and outcomes of the project. Kia ora, everybody. So here's just a wee bit of a screenshot um, of the topics of discussion that we hosted in Te Pukapu, the Hub. So we had a variety of presenters, so academics um, across many disciplines that Judy's already alluded to, um, and librarians also got to host sessions in a hugely diverse range of topics. So including, but not exclusive, data wrangling with Twitter, looking at cultural heritage collections, audiovisual essays, deep learning for handwriting recognition, we had some fun times using the VR headsets um, to prepare for job interviews, which was heaps of fun. Um, and so that's just a very brief overview of some of the sessions that we hosted in the hub. And can I just say that Judy and I are actually sitting in the hub right now. Um, they're probably not the greatest view of um, the space, but maybe we can show you later. Um, so in the conclusion of our project and our time in the hub, um, we reflected on the success and challenges. So the successes first, we think we had a really good turnout of attendees um, with all of our seminars. Again, given the, the small space, we squeezed people in. So we had both library and general staff, academics and students um, from within the humanities, but also from computer science backgrounds. So the seminars were a really great way of showcasing the current digital humanities research and teaching being undertaken at Otago. And it enabled valuable cross-disciplinary conversations and relationship building between staff and students who wouldn't normally cross paths. As subject librarians, as Judy's already alluded to as well, we have well-established connections with our academics and students across many disciplines. So the library is in a good position to support DH and played a pivotal role in bringing together those interested in and already participating in DH. Um, as part of this presentation, we asked some of our 
um, academics participating in the DH space to give us some feedback about the library in the DH space. So we're going to play a wee video for you and some of the uh, presenters are quite um, quiet so you may need to tune your speakers up but we'll try and make sure ours is as loud as possible for you as well. Let's play a wee brief video. and librarians is you have such a phenomenal skill set in dealing with data and collections which helps me because I can draw on that expertise. The major reason I think it's good to have libraries involved um, is uh, some sort of centralization of things mm -hmm. basically so that it's not, not, not so things are not entirely discipline bound. Uh, you know if I could send a telepathic or subliminal message to library management it would try to nudge them toward the attitude you know whereby digital humanities uh, isn't something uh, that would be additional to uh, or a kind of nice to have uh, in terms of the profile of the staff uh, it's something that you guys are already doing and uh, to some extent otherwise should be doing Uh, definitely, it was great to have a space for people who were interested in DH or had been doing DH to come together and actually talk about the projects. So yes, is the short version. Um, the one I participated in was well run and informative. Um, and then you know, specific to your question, uh, just having them going on, got the, some announcements going on and posters going up and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, of course I do. Um, but I think to flip that question on its head a little bit, it was also a way to promote the uh, unique skills and expertise of uh, the library staff uh, themselves. So it gave us an opportunity to see what you guys uh, are capable of bringing to the DH table. So just a few brief highlights there um, from the staff whose names um, will be familiar. Um, and Sally Hunt is actually presenting right now um, at the same time as well. So we also sought some feedback from all the attendees at the session. So just a few little quotes there. Um, and we thought we picked these ones because they really did highlight and align with our aims of trying to connect and collaborate um, and bring together the DH community at Otago. And also um, too far. Um, and also I wanted to um, mention feedback from the Vice Chancellor's report to the University Council in 2019, um, again showcasing the Digital Humanities Expo and Hub. So of course, um, our, our time at the Hub didn't come without its challenges. So COVID of course seems to be forefront of um, everything at the moment. So we had to pause our seminar series um, because of COVID, not least of which the hub was very tiny and we couldn't actually fit people in in a socially distanced manner. So we had to pause um, our seminar series. As Judy said earlier too, these um, seminar sessions were really time consuming for us. So we were uh, having to create some topic ideas, um, get in contact and entice presenters to host some sessions. We were advertising, we were creating blog posts. Um, so that was on top of our business as usual work. So as much as we really enjoyed doing it, being part of the community, um, it was a little bit time consuming. Also, there were changes in leaderships um, at the library and in the wider university. And whilst there is a really supportive and interested and engaged DH community at Otago, um, I really wanted to particularly mention the Digital Humanities Initiative here at Otago. The high level support um, and strategic vision from the university is still a work in progress. So DH and the library continued, um, even though they are seminar series paused, uh, we carried on supporting DH as much as we could. In 2021, um, subject librarians, Alexander Ritchie, our colleague, one of them, mm -hmm. and Kate, who will be presenting uh, later in the week, are involved in the launch of the first undergraduate DH paper taught at Otago. The hub doubled in its size, so we um, managed to fit some more um, seating in, so we're hoping that next year we'll be able to have some more attendees um, and more space to utilise the VR. 
Um, it is still being utilised um, extensively by students. So there's um, undergraduate teaching. So the English and Linguistics Department, Media and Film are still using this as part of their undergraduate teaching. We're using it as a consultation space um, and there's a literary games group um, and Callum and Jacob are also presenting at the conference. Mm -hmm. So the hub is being used um, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And we're also <coughs> in the process of redeveloping our library digital humanities guide to feature new projects, tools and people at Otago and the wider DH community. So the future of DH in the library, um, we're really eager to reinvigorate the seminar series for 2022 and get back into this hub space and working with our working within the DH community at Otago. And we're also really keen to collaborate with our GLAM sector colleagues, um, not just at Otago and Otipoti, but also around New Zealand. And given some of the sessions we've attended recently, um, perhaps looking at some collaborations even internationally. So that is a really brief overview of our project, um, <coughs> Te Pukapu, the Hub. I thank you very much, Namihi, and we'll pass it over to the next group. Thanks very much. That was really interesting to hear all about everything you've been up to. So our last paper for the session is the long paper, and that's Sarah Johnston talking about resurfacing archival sound and humanities research, the recordings of the New Zealand World War II mobile broadcasting units. Thanks, Sarah. Kia ora koutou. I'll just share my screen here. Sorry. My screen is not sharing properly. All right. Ta da. Um, Tina Koto Katawa. So, um, Coursera Johnston Topo Ingwa, No Nati Rakai Parker, Nati Kahinu, Nati Kakiha, Oku Tipuna, Ko Tahi Toku Kainga, Ko Tene Taku Mihi Kina Tanga Tafinoa, O Te Rohe Nei. Nai tuahuriri nai tahu, tene te mihi kia koto. Um, so that was just a greeting acknowledging um, my Māori and Pākehā ancestors and greeting the people on um, whose land I live and work here in Ototahi Christchurch. So my presentations about my work with sound recordings um, of the past and it contains the voices of those who have gone before us. So I acknowledge them and also the many broadcasters, radio broadcasters and archivists who through their mahi have enabled us to still hear these voices today. So I am a newbie in the field of digital humanities. My background is as a worker in the GLAM sector. Um, I'm currently employed at the University of Canterbury's Macmillan Brown Library. And prior to that, I worked with the Radio mm -hmm. New Zealand <coughs> Sound Archives at Ngā Taonga Sound and Vision, New Zealand's archive of film, television and sound. Um, my past um, experiences, I'm also a journalist, a former radio journalist and broadcaster, and I work in the public history space as a radio historian. Last week was the um, 100th anniversary of the beginning of radio here in New Zealand, as I'm sure um, our Otago colleagues will, will know, because it happened there. Um, and so it's been a, quite a busy time. So I work at the Macmillan Brown Library, but um, I'll just to, to clarify, I'm here today in my capacity as an independent sound history researcher, but thanks to, to UC for enabling me to take part. Mm -hmm. So the, the theme of this conference, the um, Karena Rina Te Taukaya, Creating Communities, is what really prompted me to offer this presentation. Um, my current research project into these recordings um, made during World War II has um, seen me collaborating and, and sort of creating a community across several institutions who are interested in and involved in these, um, this collection of recordings. And my past experience as a sound archivist meant engaging with diverse communities to enable them to access and engage with their sound past, whether yeah. iwi Māori, academic researchers, creative and artistic practitioners, um, producers, media or heritage and cultural institutions. 
So I'm going to talk about my current research project and um, collaboration with institutional communities around it. And then I'd like to talk a bit more generally about um, archival sound, um, particularly broadcast, so radio um, archives, as a resource for digital humanities research and um, my experience working in the, in the public history and public humanities space resurfacing this material. So just a little bit of, of, of history. In 2019, I nominated um, a collection of sound recordings that's held in the Radio New Zealand Sound Archives, which is part of Natong, a sound and vision. I nominated it for inclusion in the UNESCO Aotearoa Memory of the World Register. Um, the collection was recognised by UNESCO as, as being a significant a piece of significant documentary heritage, and it was added to the register. And this is just a screenshot of the um, that the entry of this collection in the um, Aotearoa Memory of the World website. So these are recordings made during World War II between 1940 and 1945 by the New Zealand Broadcasting Service mobile units. And they travelled overseas with New Zealand's troops uh, in North Africa, through the Middle East, through Italy and the Pacific, making recordings which were um, for broadcast on radio back home. They were recorded, um, the recording medium of the time was um, disc. This was before the era of magnetic tape recording. And so these are, if you imagine a vinyl LP um, and go out a bit, they're a bit broader, um, and they are made of a nitrocellulose lacquer over an aluminium base. So they're a bit more rigid than a vinyl LP, but the principle is the same. Um, this year, I was fortunate to receive funding from the Judith Binney Trust and the New Zealand History Research Fund to do some work on the history of these recordings, their contents, um, the contexts in which they were recorded, broadcast, and how they were heard and received by radio audiences back in New Zealand, which is something I'm really interested in. And as part of my work, I'm also um, enhancing the existing descriptions of the contents of these recordings to try and make them more discoverable and um, also verifying the names and identities of the hundreds of um, on New Zealanders whose voices are heard on them. So one of the reasons I applied for this funding back in the uh, beginning of 2020, I think it was, is that as a former journalist and as a researcher, I, I recognise what a rich repository radio sound archives are, um, not only for historians, but as a source of stories for creatives and people working in many fields of the digital humanities. But the problem is getting the data and getting the stories that that data can tell out of these recordings, because until the advent of the internet and digital audio and the ability to easily transport this um, material around on, on files such as mp3s it was often technically quite difficult to access archival sound you had to pay for copies to be made on cassettes or dubbed onto cds later and also due to the um the nature of archival sound recordings their contents are often quite opaque to researchers um, when, when you look at a recording, it doesn't really give up very much information. There might be a little bit of metadata on the, the label of the disc, but that's about it. So unless they've been transcribed, which is very rare due to the resourcing that it takes for sound recordings to, to be transcribed, um, this collection is often, well, hasn't often been used by researchers. For example, here we have material recorded in the conflict zones of World War II with New Zealanders, and yet it's very rarely been used by New Zealand military historians, and, and that is for some of those reasons, I believe. So a brief history of, of how this collection came to be. Um, in February 1940, we were at war. Um, New Zealand broadcasting was almost entirely nationalised and under government control, and this man, an academic or a former academic from Canterbury University College, Professor James Shelley, had been appointed as Director of Broadcasting. And in February 1940, he wrote to the government and suggested that a mobile unit be sent overseas with New Zealand's forces. And he wrote that the unit's work would have immediate value in maintaining the morale of the troops 
and the nation by keeping New Zealanders in touch with their men overseas. And he listed among its proposed activities that the unit would make disc records of events, the voices of personalities, eyewitness accounts, etc., for sending to New Zealand to broadcast here and to form part of an historical library of the war for future use. So to those of us who work in libraries and archives, that's the real kicker, that last bit. Um, and some 80 years later, since they were recorded, I, I think that this historical library has really only just begun to fully realise its potential, and that's thanks to digitisation and the ability to now have online access to um, digitised recordings. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the start of radio broadcasting heading overseas to war for the first time. And for the next five years, small teams of broadcasters would travel with New Zealanders through conflict zones, recording their voices using mobile disc recorders. Using these portable recorders meant that the radio's microphones could start recording outside of the studio. And by doing that, they were capturing the experiences of a much broader range of New Zealanders rather than just those who were invited to come into a radio studio as they were back in New Zealand. You know, it's a very formal and artificial environment, especially in the um, 1930s, 1940s. So this is the, um, the first of the small teams that headed overseas. Um, and this is um, these three men here were all employees of the broadcasting service, although once they um, arrived they were pretty much what we would call today embedded in the military they were still paid by the broadcasting service but they were given military rank and they were subject to uh, military control and censorship um, so this is a brief excerpt of one of their first recordings this is um, Doug Lawrenceson who was an announcer he's the chap with the pipe there um, and he's describing the thousands of men arriving on the Wellington docks by train and boarding the troop ships. This is in Wellington in August 1940, the third echelon of the uh, New Zealand Expeditionary Forces about to set sail with these guys part of it. So he, the full recording is about 30 minutes long and he paints a very vivid description, a sound picture, if you like, of what he can see. But it's the background sound that I particularly find powerful about this recording. It really... Um, transports you to wartime New Zealand. Troops already on board are lining the rails and are cheering their friends as they embark on our ship or the one opposite. Let's switch over to our next microphone for a moment and listen to them greeting a train which arrived for our other transport. So over the next five years in which they were in action, the mobile unit broadcasters recorded interviews with, um, as I said, this broad cross-section of New Zealand servicemen. I say servicemen, but there are actually a few women. There were a few nurses who managed to um, get in front of the microphone, um, but it is very much a, um, a masculine voice that comes through in these recordings. Um, and they talked... Um, about their role in the war. They were interviewed about the part that they were playing, and this wasn't necessarily by any means um, focused on military action. They made programs with um, guys who were working in an army bakery in Egypt making meat pies for the New Zealand forces. They talked to people who worked in the post office, making sure that, that the soldiers got their mail. Um, it, was, it was really quite a cross-section. I mean, yes, they talked to General Bernard Freiburg, but they also talked to, to these other guys as well. 
Um, this is Arch Curry holding the microphone in these two photos here. He was a Christchurch uh, radio announcer and he, he was quite a well-known voice already uh, when he went overseas and he became one of the best known voices of the mobile unit as heard um, back in New Zealand during the war. Um, so the, the type of material they produced falls roughly into these categories. Um, there were what we would call today a voice reports. These are sort of um, eyewitness accounts of, of military action. And these were often broadcast via the BBC, who would then relay them on shortwave back to New Zealand. These, these are the more time critical um, items. Then there's interviews and talks with people. There's recordings of events, so, um, <clears throat> non, not necessarily military things, but concerts, entertainments, sporting events, there's rugby matches, of course, um, and social gatherings. And then there are the greetings and messages home, which became um, incredibly popular back in New Zealand, just really simple greetings from the soldiers themselves. So, as I said, um, a lot of the material in this collection, I feel, has not really been tapped yet to, to its full potential. But there is um, one example or one sub-collection, I guess you could call it, which ha has been used in a really um, interesting and important project that I'd just like to talk about a little. Um, and this is the website created by um, New Zealand's Ministry for Culture and Heritage to recognise the contribution of the 28 Māori Battalion, which was New Zealand's most celebrated unit of the war. Um, starting in 2010, Dr. Monty Suter and the Ministry for Culture and Heritage staff worked with the RNZ Sound Archives team to identify and digitise recordings made by the mobile units with men of the Māori Battalion. These have been transcribed in many cases on the, on the website. Um, often they've been translated and they are, the audio has been uploaded. So it's a really great resource for um, students and for, for whānau, for descendants of these men. It's a great example of resurfacing archival sound recordings, recontextualising them and presenting them to new digital audiences some 80 years after they were recorded. Um, many of the men in the Māori Battalion were first language speakers of te reo Māori, so their kōrero and waata their, um, their speech and songs are a really valuable resource in the ongoing effort to revitalise te reo Māori. So just a couple of examples of um, audio which is recorded by the mobile unit and is available on this, this website just to illustrate this. Um, the first is a report by the mobile unit's commentator Arch Curry, who we saw just in those photos earlier. And this is a report um, that he filed via the BBC in June 1943 to tell New Zealand that a Victoria Cross had been awarded posthumously to a soldier of the Māori Battalion, to Moana Nui Akiwa Narimu. Um, it was for action in which he died fighting in Tunisia earlier that year. So this was the first Victoria Cross awarded to a Māori soldier. And the fact that he died achieving it made it an incredibly um, significant and poignant event um, for New Zealand, but especially for Te Iwi Māori. So because this was a major news item, the report was sent from the mobile unit in Egypt to the BBC in London via radio telephone. Um, they then recorded it on disc in London and then rebroadcast it via shortwave to New Zealand, where it was again recorded and then rebroadcast for um, the, the domestic radio audience. So this recording is actually of the BBC broadcast from London. So what we hear first is the BBC announcer, who incidentally was a New Zealander. Uh, she is a woman named Noni Wright, who, who worked for the BBC during the war. And then we hear the start of Arch Curry's report filed from Cairo. Um, because it was filed by a shortwave, the audio quality is pretty dire, so I'm just going to play the start of this. So 
So that um, Arch Curry files his report, which goes on for about another three minutes. Then there's a report in English by the then commander of the Maori battalion. And then we hear um, Interreo Maori from this man. This is um, a page from the Maori battalion website, just a screenshot of that. And this is Captain Peter Awateri, who was um, um, Te Moana Nui Aki Narimu's unit commander at the time. And he addresses the Maori people in Te Reo Maori. Uh, and again, this was recorded by the mobile unit. Um, so this is his the start of his address. He's using um, formal, traditional methods of addressing the tribes of New Zealand who would have been listening in to this um, historic broadcast. <laughs> So by resurfacing this sort of powerful historic radio broadcast and presenting it to a digital audience, the Māori Battalion website ensures that these stories can live on and that the descendants of these men, men can not only hear their ancestors but can learn their stories. So to further enable this sort of reuse of these archival radio recordings, I'm working with Ngā Taonga Sound and Vision to enhance the existing descriptions of them um, contained in Ngā Taonga's online database. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm also trying to verify the identities of the voices that are heard on the recordings. Many of the speakers, um, their names are not listed in any surviving metadata from the time of the recording. There were lists of the names of the speakers sent back to New Zealand at the time of the recordings with, with the discs, but these have not survived in the sound archives and I have not been able to find any trace of them in, in any archive at this point. So to establish who is speaking on a recording, you have to listen to it and then make a best guess at their name when they're introduced. So until the advent of an easily, um, an easily accessible database, um, this was very difficult for sound archivists of the past to do. So best guess was, was all they had. They certainly didn't have the resourcing to spend months in the, um, in the military archives and, and trent them going through records to try and see who was who. But um, I'm using um, or working with Auckland War Memorial Museum's online cenotaph database, which has used enlistment records and crowdsourced contributions to populate this database of all the men and women who've served in New Zealand's armed forces. And that's from the colonial land wars right through to Afghanistan. So to give you um, an example of how this sort of process works, um, here is one of the mobile unit's um, very early recordings once they got to Egypt. Um, and this is how it looks on Natanga Sound and Visions um, online database. So this is a greeting recorded from a man who was in Mardi camp in December 1940. Um, at the, the title of it is just the is what existed on the disc label. It was a greeting from Egypt from someone called Tom Carroll, and it was digitised and uploaded to Natanga's web database. So we'll just have a listen to this, and this is a very typical um, greeting. Um, actually, it's a bit longer. It's a minute fourteen, whereas most of them are, are much shorter. But let's just have a listen to Tom Carroll from 1940. Hello everybody, this time in the suit request section we've got Tom Carroll and he's calling 18 Melford Avenue, Balmoral, in Auckland. Hello Wynne and Dad and Mum and all at home and Jim and Rosaline and Rich and Bobby too. I hope you're all in as good of health and spirits as I am right now. I'm just starting out for a little leave in Cairo. Have a good time everybody just like I'm having here. And I'm sure it won't seem very long then until you'll hear my somewhat fairy-like military boots hitting the concrete path. 
this little cell in hospital has made me so light of foot and fit that I can dance with them on half nails at all. Good Christmas holidays and happy new year to you all and pleasant memories of the 27th week. Goodbye and good luck to everybody. And now listen with me to my favorite song, Little Grey Home in the Woods. So that recording was for a um, was for a request session, basically, and they dropped that idea quite quickly because it took up way too much time. And what people back home really wanted to hear was the men themselves. But like using the information contained in that in that recording, um, I identified him as as this man here. This is his entry in online cenotaph. Um, Tom Carroll is in fact Thomas Anthony Carroll. And his entry in Cenotaph is a really nice, fulsome one. He has obviously a lot of family still who remember him lovingly and um, have uploaded a photo and all sorts of other information. Um, his recording was really helpful in that it actually gave his full address. It was 18 Telford Avenue, Balmoral, and very happily there it is as his enlistment address on Cenotaph. Sadly, that practice didn't continue, and most of the um, speakers in the mobile unit just give their name and a location. So they're calling Christchurch, they're calling um, Portobello, they're calling, it's usually just a location, not necessarily a city, often it's a suburb if they're from a city. But yeah, there's a, usually there's a, quite a bit of digging to be done to identify the speaker. But um, once we are able to identify them, if you well, now when you scroll to the bottom of Tom Carroll's entry on Cenotaph, there's a link there so you can click through to Nātonga and hear him speak. And um, what the online Cenotaph team are doing is they've created a data set of all the men and women who have entries on Cenotaph and whose voices I have identified so far in the mobile unit discs. So eventually, in the fullness of time, you'll be able to click through from each veteran's page and online cenotaph to hear their digitised recording uploaded onto Nātaonga Sound and Visions catalogue. But there are hundreds, if not thousands, of recordings like that in this collection, so it's going to be a long process. But this work will not only improve discoverability and access for researchers, but it will enhance the ability of descendants to discover and hear the voices of their ancestors. So that is um, what I am working on currently, but I'd also like to talk a little bit more broadly just about the potential of um, the RNZ Sound Archives as a, as a source of research material um, for digital humanities communities. So um, many of you may be familiar with um, these projects. This is the, um, the work of the linguistics team at the University of Canterbury, who are really pioneers in using the sound archives for um, something besides radio programs. They use the oral history recordings made by the New Zealand Broadcasting Service, which was the, the forerunner of Radio New Zealand, um, made up just after the war, 1946, 1948, using the same technology as the wartime mobile units. Um, they traveled around the country in a truck and made recordings with elderly speakers. And these were people who were Already in the 80s, often by in, 19, in the 1940s, there were people who were born as far back as the 1860s, 1850s. And this formed a corpus that the, um, the Origins of New Zealand English Project and the um, Ma Onzi Study of Changing Pronunciation of Te Reo Māori could use. And, and these projects began back in 2004 and are still ongoing. Um, there are countless other bodies of recordings in the radio archives that could form the basis for deeper humanities research. Um, I'm quite excited by the um, potential of speech to text transcription software, which is advancing rapidly. Um, uh, the team up at Tehiku Media in Northland have been working with um, speech to text recognition of Te Reo Māori. And I would love to see some researchers doing a, a deeper dive into the Ngā Tonga Korero archive. This is an archive within the Radio New Zealand Sound Archives. It's of the Māori radio programs that um, the broadcasting service created between 19, from, from the 1960s up until the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, before the iwi radio network really got going. The iwi radio stations really started to take over the role of of broadcasting to Māori audiences. 
But before that, there's a good 30 years of, of Māori radio material just waiting to be tapped into. It's all been digitised. Um, it can be accessed online and it's just there for analysis, whether that's historical, social, linguistic, you know, I'd love to see someone getting involved in that. Um, and just I'd like to talk briefly about um, the, the creative humanities. Um, so artists and producers use archival sound recordings in, in a lot of projects. I mean, obviously radio programs is, is the natural one, but also um, any kind of film projects they are used and also in um, the sonic arts. So this is um, a work from 2015 by Dougal McKinnon of Victoria University. Um, this is just a video of his um, installation called Lost Oscillations, which um, he created for a, for a festival here in Christchurch, a Sonic Arts Festival. And it, he created a, basically a, a stylized map of inner city Christchurch and populated it with archival radio um, sound recordings, which had been made in locations that had been either destroyed or irrevocably changed by the 2010-2011 earthquake sequences. So you hear the bells of the ruined cathedral, you hear um, protests against the 1981 Springbok rugby tour, there's a concert in a theatre that was demolished, there's the sounds of the royal visit of 1954 in the streets of Christchurch. And all of these can be played and mixed by um, people interacting with this installation, putting their fingers on the touch pads on the map. And he installed it um, quite poignantly in one of the, the many countless gravel patches which marked the site of a former building in Christchurch. And these gravel patches made up much of our um, city's central business district for many years, and there's still a few of them with us today. So um, I'll just play this. Um, it starts with a lot of static, so don't worry if it sounds terrible to start with.
finally. Um, I just wanted to touch on um, work in the public history sphere using um, sound archival material, you know, this repository of, of texts which can speak quite literally um, to our past. So this is just a selection of, um, I guess, screenshots, headlines from Radio New Zealand's website of um, pages that um, I helped create for the last five years up until last November. I used to produce and present a weekly sound archives radio segment on Radio New Zealand um, with, in their afternoon show with Jesse Mulligan. And I would cur curate archival sound recordings around a topic, sometimes an anniversary, sometimes just something that was in the news, sometimes just something awesome that I had found in the archives and thought people needed to hear and um, just presented those with with context and usually with um, some online images and you know, contextualized resurface archival sound recordings. So that is um, pretty much the end of my presentation. So I guess if um, we return now and um, have, a, have at us with questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. So just as a reminder to people who may have come in late, we're doing questions and discussion based on all three papers at this point. So if you had thoughts from earlier, feel free to, um, to bring those up now as well, as well as asking questions or bringing up things relating to this last most recent paper. Um, I'm just checking the comments. I don't think anybody left any questions in the comments. Um, so we'll go with putting your hands up in the, in the participant list using the hands up emoji. So I'm just looking now to see if anybody already has a hand up. I don't see, I don't see anyone. They're all stunned by the, the brilliance of these presentations into silence. Oh, here we go. Now we do have, a, we have one from Alexis. If, if the audience don't want to ask a question, that is fine. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about the Digi Hub. Um, I was wondering uh, if you might have shared it in your presentation, Nicole, sorry if I missed it, but can you characterise the kind of people who came along to your seminar series? Were you, what was the mix of undergraduate students, higher degree students, staff, like, and, and, and do you have a perception or uh, and, and do you know what they were looking for in coming along to these seminars? So we did do um, a survey afterwards um, and sort of at the time because it was a project <coughs> to um, justify our time. Um, in the hub so yes we um mostly postgraduates um it was it wasn't really aimed at undergraduates as such but they could have come along if they wanted to um this was pre the digital humanities paper um targeting undergraduates so um yeah so the, the primary focus was postgraduates and academics um and some of the students that came along were starting to undertake dh projects um, and it was kind of making connections with supervisors and academics. Um, I don't know whether Alexander and Judy want to add to that. I think that's a fair characterization, Lisa. I think um, we had lots of support from colleagues within the library as well. And um, I think there was, there was interest within the library, but also perhaps they just felt sorry for us and, and came along to um, um, help us feel not. Um, alone but I think that the interesting thing reflecting on it and talking um, with Judy and Lisa about it I think I had an idea that we were going to transform uh, humanities you know old school humanists into digital humanists and of course that's you know complete nonsense um, you know, meanwhile um, Fairburn I think we um, we wanted to disrupt some of that um, kind of antagonism that we were very mindful of, particularly you know uh, across in the Americas um, around you know old school humanists feeling like they were being attacked and that DH was just a grand neoliberal conspiracy um, or only a grand neoliberal conspiracy. <laughs> um, and but I think. I kind of came to understand that it's actually that the where we have our limit, where we put our limited energy is kind of key. And so focusing on those kind of postgrad students, early career academics, kind of has more um, kind of fulfillment for us and perhaps for those folks in terms of building the community and getting the most benefit out of everyone's limited energy and resources. I don't know. Um, 
yeah, whether that's helpful or actually answers your question. We also got some staff who were um, not necessarily in the DH space, but kind of on the cusp of it and had other um, initiatives that they were working on um, as well. So not necessarily completely in the digital humanity space, but like interested in where it was going to go. And bearing in mind, we had eight people, two of whom were usually librarians. So, <laughs> you know, it, we were lucky to have perhaps one mm. presenter who was an academic and maybe three three students or a couple of academics yeah. and a few students. So it wasn't huge, but it was it was a good use of our time and a good way to collaborate. Mm. I'll just lift up and this this is the the sum total of the hub space that we're in. So it's not huge. <laughs> it's kind of a long corridor space. Yeah, we managed to squeeze people in, which was great. And, and pre-COVID, one of the lovely things about it was there was a, a real enforced intimacy of the space. And I think that really helped the project um, because one of the, the defining features of it for me was the, the real um, non-hierarchical collaboration across library and academic staff um, and the mutual respect that was kind of sh shared through that. And the, the intimacy of the hub actually, I think, enhanced that or, or you know, made it unavoidable because you were sitting right next to someone kind of perched on the edge of a seat listening to a presentation. It was harder to maintain your kind of um, your distance both physically and kind of intellectually. Yeah. And I think for um, for me personally, being a newbie into the DH world, it had a little bit of imposter syndrome going on and thinking, why why am I here? Why is the library here? And then I think, you know, as Alexander said, we're sitting so close to academics and being involved with all these talks and hosting them and enticing them in that it was actually really great training um, and upskilling for us. So. I have a question of my own actually that, that kind of, I, I think it relates to this one a little bit, but it's more for the first um, paper. And that's that there, there seems to be a bit of an issue in DH and GLAM spaces that the more and more technical you go, so with AI being one of those extremely technical areas, um, the less diverse the community seems to become. Um, partly due to historical reasons, socialization reasons. We, we all know the reasons, but um, I think to some extent we're doing a lot better on the gender front now in these sort of hardcore technological areas, but in terms of race, not so much. Um, and I'm just wondering if people who've, who've been working in this, this AI glam space and also to some extent working on initiatives to try to bring dig the digital into humanities areas, which which maybe haven't yet embraced them, have found things that that work to diversify it, or whether this is something you're grappling with, whether you have ideas, I, I'd love to share some of those or hear, hear about some of those. Because I think there is this, this, this risk that, that the, the hardcore techie coding parts of DH become this, this very white space, um, more so than some of the other areas. It's a really good and real question, Rachel. Um, I, my experience is a little bit different in that I feel that the intersection of humanities and the glam sector are places that are particularly homogenous culturally. Mm. Um, and yeah, that's like, like I said, there's a, people have done papers about that, the, 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 the reasons that certain people go into certain um, paths. Um, some of the, um, in my, it, yeah, I, it's a really hard question to answer, actually. <laughs> um, I think that the, um, it's for, wearing the AI for lamb hat, I think there's people in our community who are interested in the complexity of the collections that we have, um, even if they're not acting on behalf of their own community, but recognising the diversity of the space that we're working in. And there's an intersection between the interest in data curation and, um, and making material available and the emerging field of sort of critical librarianship as well, which is tackling some of those things and looking at the structural problems with how we organize knowledge in these sorts of institutions and that conflict between in order to make something computationally useful, it needs to be organized in a way and the frameworks with which we organize those things are deeply rooted in a legacy that um, perpetuates a certain kind of culture in our environments. And so that's definitely a, matter of discussion in terms of participants it's a hard one 
I would actually say, if I can just and totally anecdotally um, say my experience wearing my University of Adelaide library hat when we've been doing digital humanities activities here, um, there are um, people from, um, from non-Anglo backgrounds coming in and participating in this program in some circumstances, but often they're the people that come in from outside the humanities. So they're people who come in, we've had like, forensic criminologists, we've had computer science, we've had um, people, lots of people in the VR space as well. And so um, where it gets particularly not diverse is the purest film of the humanities sort of side of things. And it's where those interdisciplinary connections are sort of finding a space mm -hmm. that um, we see a few more sort of um, non, yeah, different faces in the room, I, I'd say. If that, but that's totally, I don't even have any numbers or it's just my, my feel for where we've gone with that experience. Um, Sydney, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I guess two points, if I may. The first one is a plug for tomorrow's talk at 4 p.m. with my colleagues, uh, Rere Noah Rangi Pope and Rhys Owen. And we'll be talking about some of these issues around um, how you build a research team, uh, how it becomes transdisciplinary uh, and includes uh, real tirohanga Māori, a Māori lens in a Kopapa Māori setting. So we have uh, positioned our National Science Challenge research in exactly in a place which demands recruitment of Māori researchers, Māori software engineers, and women in tech. So that's a very uh, specific and strategic thing that we've done to um, facilitate addressing the problem that we're looking at. So we'll be talking a bit about that in our 10 minute wonder tomorrow. So join us if you want to hear more about that. But the other point I want to make is um, a product of the cultural AI discussions that I've been having internationally, whereby there is a shift in thinking uh, as a reaction to data science in particular, to something that's been framed up as data humanism, and even data feminism. And what that is doing is privileging uh, collaboration with communities. It's suggesting that um, if you don't have a real world problem that you're committed ethically to address, then you're just doing research on the back of other people and other people's data and you have nothing to offer them in particular. Linda Tua Y. Smith would characterize that as helicopter research. You zip in, you zip out, you grab data, you do something with it, and the community that is disenfranchised and disempowered has no say in what you're doing with their data, no control over it, um, and no uh, opportunity to be part of the process. And um, Jura Thorpe is uh, in New York. He's an amazing data visualization creative. He's been working um, all over Africa, um, trying to create devices whereby individual communities can monitor, uh, for example, their own environmental spaces that they have a say then with their own data gathering to be able to chart the future of their whenua, of their spaces, um, dealing with climate change, dealing with really important issues that are reframing our, our whole ways of being human um, and putting those devices in the hands of people um, for very low cost, if any, and really working in an outreach capacity to bring technology into spaces where uh, people have been um, excluded and disenfranchised. So that's a really important dimension of this data humanism movement. Um, and of course, you know, data feminism is a riff on that in a way, um, is, is another angle in the inclusive politics that are required for working in these spaces. And I have to admit that following on the work of um, Rupika Razam that I think uh, Alexander is going to be talking about later in the week as well, uh, digital humanities have, have um, in the global north context, which has framed the field, been very good at uh, reflecting on their practices but only very recently understanding that they actually have to address issues of diversity, equality, and inclusion. And across the spectrum, I think that's something that um, many um, organizations, societies, and individual uh, researchers, 
um, are becoming both aware of and needing to embed in their own practice. So just a few observations of uh, a couple of trends, but um, shout out to Alexander and his team and their talk and also for um, our team uh, later in the conference. Thanks, yeah, that, those are some really good thoughts. Um, I don't see any other hands up. Do other people have questions, comments, other directions they'd like to take this in, things they wanted to know more about? Oh, Sydney, yes. This is a quick one and it's, it's for Sarah, please. Um, in your description of the various roles of individuals in the mobile broadcasting unit, there was this one that was very evocative called the observer. And I'm wondering if you could unpack what that is because we saw photographers, <laughs> but what is the role of the observer and how is that factoring into your research? Um, it's, it really was, they, they didn't, <laughs> Initially, they didn't really know what to call themselves. So you had the engineer and the assistant engineer, who were the, one, the techie guys who were, were operating the equipment. Um, the role of a radio journalist didn't exist. Um, and they went off, the, the person who did the speaking was either called an observer or a commentator. And a commentator kind of now, you know, conjures up watching a sports event. But, yeah, they were basically, you know, describing what they saw and an observer was a similar uh, just a, a synonym really for that they were observing and then relaying what they were seeing but um i find it really interesting that when they got to egypt and they started interacting <coughs> with um other broadcasters um the bbc had a a fairly legendary um war correspondent richard dimbleby who they had quite a lot to do with in cairo there were australians there um and and people from other broad uh, you know other oh, empires is. broadcasting service um they started to refer to themselves as war correspondents so i think they went from this role of observer slash commentator and they started to see themselves more like their colleagues in the press who were war correspondents. You know, that name was, that, that role had been established for, for a long time. And they actually, um, you know, the physical manifestation of this is they changed their shoulder stripes, the New Zealand guys. They went off with New Zealand Broadcasting written on their shoulders. And um, I have yet to pinpoint the date when it happened, but they started, they changed and started using war correspondent badges on their shoulders. So yeah, that's just an interesting little change. And the, the, the start of this role of a radio journalist starting to develop. Mm. Very cool. Anybody else? I thought maybe we would all appreciate a slightly longer break before the next panel. So um, thank you once again to all of our speakers today. Those were really interesting talks and projects to learn about. And um, thanks for all of you who attended as well. See you in the next session. <laughs>